Um, I can't get out of Timothy, and I don't believe you want me to. It's just been so powerful and so rich uh, to me, and, and, and I've just been feasting uh, out of it now for a number of weeks. I don't know how long we'll stay here, but we'll stay here when God says move on. Uh, but, but today, it's almost as if Paul is telling Timothy, here are the instructions you're to have for a public worship service. And, and it is that, but it goes much deeper and way beyond instructions for a public worship service. It really gets down to the nuts and the bolts and foundations. He's saying to Timothy, hey, Timothy, you know, you're young and you're getting started in ministry. You you're, hadn't been saved very long. And understand the success of your ministry uh, the success of you as a child of God is going to depend on the foundation that you lay your ministry and your life on. Now, you know, that down in Charlotte, they're building these humongous buildings down there. And you know this to be true, don't you? That before that building can go up, they have to, what? Go down. Because they know the importance of a foundation. Now, if you're going to be who God wants you to be, you're going to be pleasing unto God. You better have the right foundation because when the earthquakes do come, I didn't say if they come. I said when they come, that if you want your life to stand, if you want your ministry to stand, you want to be successful in your walk with God then you better be building your life on the right foundation. So let's pick it up. Stand with me, if you will. First Timothy uh, chapter one, and uh, we will look at uh, verse, uh, chapter two, verse one. First Timothy chapter two, verse one. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life or peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. Who will have all, I want to say it again. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Father, Lord, you put this word in my heart. Uh, Lord, not for me to keep to myself, but to impart it to your people. And Lord, I thank you uh, for how it has grown in my heart and how, Lord, that uh, we, we marinated on your word, thought through this. And now, Lord, help me to preach under the anointing of your word right now and your Holy Spirit. And, and, and Lord, not for fame or fortune, but so that somebody might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, <clears throat> the first building block in this foundation that Paul is giving to Timothy is, is really very simple. It's appropriate prayer. Write it down somewhere appropriate prayer. Now there are seven words in the New Testament that are translated prayer and Paul uses four of those words uh, right here in this beginning of the second chapter. The first one I want you to watch with me is the word supplications, supplications. It's the word uh, deesis. Uh, it's 19 times recorded in the New Testament and it's someone who is simply making a request. Uh, I would say, Kathy, uh, I'm thirsty. Uh, would you go get me a drink of water? And, and it's a simple request that is based on a need. In other words, uh, you, you may be here this morning and you would say, uh, Lord, I need a job. Uh, Joey had a prayer answered this week. He's been praying, Lord, I need a spouse. And Anna says, Lord, I need a spouse. And so these simple requests that have been made. Then he uses a gen generic term, a, a generalized term. Uh, not only supplications, he says the next one is prayers. Prayers. 
Uh, it's, it's the word prosuke. It's 37 times in the New Testament. And it means something that I request of God exclusively. Uh, I, I only ask God about it. God's the only one that can answer this prayer. The third word for prayer is the word intercession. Uh, intercession. Now, th this, this word has morphed uh, into what we know now as its meaning from uh, uh, the phrase says, uh, uh, it is really uh, between two people. It started out uh, that way. Um, uh, it, it's an intimate conversation uh, between two people. But then it morphed into an intimate conversation between a person and God. But now it's, uh, it's, it's defined as an intimate conversation between one person and God on behalf of someone else. God, take care of old Rick Brown over there. He's out there on that motorcycle going crazy. And there are crazy drivers all around him. Watch over him and keep him safe. God, my children uh, have gone astray out there. And, and they're out on the edge of life. And God, watch over them. And, and so you are uh, asking God uh, on behalf of somebody else. And, and then he adds one more thing uh, to this list of prayers. He says, the giving of thanks now, isn't that an interesting thing here uh, in giving of thanks? It, it, it'd be interesting how many of us have done it. We all probably need to do it a whole lot more than what we do. But how many of us have quit going to God and said, God, I need this. God, give me that. I need this. Let me do this. If I can supply this and meet this need. How many of us have just gotten alone with God, not asking him for anything, but just to thank him? for who he is, for what he has done, for what he is doing, and for what he's going to do. But our tendency really is to be real selfish uh, in our prayers. But I dare say, friends, God loves our thanks. He loves our thanks. The Bible tells us that we are to give thanks in all things. Wow. In all circumstances, in all situations. Boy, if, if we were to interview everybody in the building, everybody in here came to this worship service today uh, with all kinds of situations, with all kinds of circumstances. Somebody came in here looking for a job. You just lost your job. You've been working someplace for 25 years or more. And all of a sudden they give you a pink slip and say, I don't need you anymore. Some of you came in here and, and, uh, and just in the last few days you separated from uh, your spouse and your marriage is about to crumble. There, some of you came from the doctor and the doctor has said uh, some pretty horrible stuff about your physical condition and the prognosis uh, for anything getting better is not very good. And some of you came in here today with, with all kinds of issues, discouragements and problems. And God says that we are to give thanks in the midst of that. Whether the wind is in our face or whether it's on our back. And then he goes on to say that we are to pray for those that are in authority over us. Now, I'll just be honest with you. I'll just get gut level transparent with you. I have a hard time praying for the federal government on April the 15th. I really do. When I'm writing that check and sending that in the mail, it's very hard for your pastor to ask God to bless the federal government. But the Bible says that we're to play, pray for, hey, by the way, can I just say a word of gratitude and thanks to all of those that are on our cultural impact team who's, who, who got Bibles and uh, sent them to the local officials, sent them to the state officials, sent them to the national officials from First Baptist Church Indian Trail, many of the signatures uh, from here that our, our deacons and leadership, and we letting them know that there's a church here in Indian Trail that is praying for them, and here's the word of God to help you guide your life and to give you wisdom when you need it. And we're getting all, thank you, Cultural Impact Team, uh, for making that happen. 
So Paul is telling Timothy here, Timothy, build your ministry, build your life. And, and I believe he's saying that to us. If we're going to be who God wants us to be, build our lives on prayer. Then there's a second building stone, and it's the godly lifestyle. Notice what he says in verse 2. That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life. <laughs> uh, now I watch the faces of our students all morning long when I got to this point, and, and uh, they're thinking, oh my goodness, what kind of description is that for a life? That's just short of being in a morgue somewhere. It's, it's just short of embalmment. It's really not when you get to thinking because God never intended for believers to acquiesce. God never intended for believers to be reclusive. God never intended for believers to be filled with passivity. God never intended for us to get in a rocking chair and just rock back and forth and let the world go by. That's not God's intention. But what he is saying, that in the midst of the pressures of this life, that the end product of our life uh, uh, it ought not to be just coming and going and coming and going and busyness and the pressures pouring in. God never intended for us to live a frenzied lifestyle, ever. But what he is saying is in the midst of this, that there should be an inner attitude a peace, a tranquility that no matter what kind of storms, and by the way, you heard the song a few minutes ago, God loves you enough to send storms. God loves you enough to put you in the desert. God loves you enough to let issues come to you so that you could learn to trust him and believe in him. So they are going to come. And when they come, Paul is saying that you and I, because of who he is in us, can live peacefully and in tranquility because we've been saved by the Prince of Peace. But you know, I, I watch, God help us, I, I watch Christians um, and their schedules, how they get so caught up that they don't even have any free time to meditate on the things of God, don't have time to pray, don't have time to study the word of God because they are constantly at the mercy of an overbooked schedule. But then he goes on to use that word honesty. And, and frankly, folks, it translates better holiness. It's the word simnotes. Uh, it means high standards of morality, willing to adopt a standard of holiness that is consistent and commensurate of God's standards. Now, when I was a kid growing up on Slater Mill Village, textile mill village down in South Carolina, uh, I heard the word holiness about every day of my life. Um, but you don't hear that. It's not trending on Twitter anymore. Um, you, you don't hear the word holiness. As a matter of fact, uh, if we were to, Ken, if we were to have a seminar uh, on holiness, we probably could uh, host everybody that came in the men's bathroom back here. Uh, nobody's interested much uh, in that term at all uh, anymore. But here's what God says. God says, be you holy as I am holy. That's not a suggestion. It's a command in the word of God. In other words, God is saying there ought to be a difference in the way that we look. There ought to be a difference in the way that we live. There ought to be a difference in the way that we talk. There ought to be a difference in what we look at and what we allow through the eye gate into the soul. There ought to be a difference when the world looks at us that they see that God has changed our life and we're not like what we used to be, that there is a stark contrast between us and the world. Now, turn with me back about two pages to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, now watch what he says. Beginning in uh, verse number 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, in holiness. 
not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, and he's forewarned us and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but holiness. And then Paul goes on to say, let me just tell you, this is not my idea, but this is God's idea. That's what he says in verse number eight. Paul said, I didn't come up with this on my own, that it's God's idea. And yet when we start talking today, um, publicly on television, as we are to a couple of million people, uh, when we start talking about holiness and sexual purity, all of a sudden the darts start getting hurled and the arrows begin to get shot and uh, the accusations begin to be hurled. Well, you're nothing but a Victorian prude. You need to get in touch with reality. That was then, this is now. And you need to be learning how to be more tolerant. Hmm. Hmm. We, 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 we're watching as the boundary lines of holiness are consistently and constantly changing. Christians are being worn down little by little by what we permit our eyes to watch now that are more vile, more wicked, more immoral and filthy than they ever used to be. And the reason is the world has been relentless, 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 throwing that garbage at us to convince us that we need to accept this new morality and receive it as normal. By the way, this, this won't cost anything. But I'm fully convinced that Hollywood would quit producing that kind of filth if God's people would finally just say, I'm not going to pay you 10 bucks to go watch it anymore. Amen. So Paul says this foundation has got to be right in your ministry and in your life or your whole ministry, your whole life, your society itself is going to crumble. Then there's a third stone. It's uh, the right view of God, a right view of God. Do you know that there's some stinking thinking out there about God right now? That there's some people out there that think that God is some kind of doting grandfather up in heaven. And he looks down at humanity and sees us in all of our sin and in our wickedness. And he says, oh, my. They see, think he's some kind of compromising, condescending. And, and, and oh my, well, I don't know what I expect. They're just human. And after all, I do have a few laws and a, ten commandments, but they're more suggestions than they are commandments. That, that's the kind of view of God that people have. My wife, when she was uh, a teenager, sang in this uh, musical, and I, I'll never forget the musical. And there was a song inside that musical, if I'm remembering right, and it was titled, He. That was the name of the song. And there was a phrase inside there, in, there was one of the, uh, the, the stanzas inside, that, one of the little verses that said this, though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he will always say, I forgive. Though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he will always say, that's just not true. And then there's some, there, there's some other people that view God as this British Bobby dressed up in his uniform and he's got a billy stick in his hand and every time we step out of line, their God is to bop us right over the head with a billy stick. 
And then there are those that have a view of God that God just created the whole universe and set things in motion and then he stepped back and folded his arms and watched his creation and now we're in a huge mess and God doesn't know what to do about it. May I say to everybody in this room, you ready? As your theology goes, so goes your life. Now let me give you what Paul's view was. In verse number three, okay? Paul says, for this is a good, for this is good and acceptable in what? The sight of God, our Savior. He's not just omnipotent and have all power. He's not just omniscient and knows everything. The Bible says he is God, our Savior. That's what he's picturing, God as. Now, you're going to blow somebody out of the water here. In verse 4, who will have all men to be saved? Who? Now, there's some hyper, hyper, hyper Calvinists that believe that you're either in one of two camps. You're either destined to go to heaven or you're destined to go to hell. And the best you can do is to hope that you're on your way to heaven. My Bible says, for God would have all men to be saved. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My Bible says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Paul is saying here that God is a God of love. God is a God of compassion. Wants everybody to be saved. Now, Notice what else, this next little phrase, to come to the knowledge of truth. You see that little phrase in there, verse four? To come to the knowledge of truth. Now, it's not just, the word knowledge there is not just that plain word that we all get about gnosis. It's not just gnosko. Uh, It's a little different word there. It really means to understand, to understand. He says, not only do I want everybody to be saved, I want them to be able to distinguish between what is true and what is not true. I got a call just recently from a church member who was just saying, preacher, I have encountered something in my life that it doesn't match up to what God's word teaches. And I was thrilled to death at that because Somewhere along the way, since the time of their salvation, they had studied the word of God and had learned what was true and what was not true and identified it just like that. Now, I love little babies. Well, I love most babies. Uh, Babies are cute. Well, most babies are cute. But but isn't it good? You, you, You see little rattles and you know, they got pacifier and they can't wait to that next bottle. But you know what, what would happen if you turn around and you looked and there was a 15 year old with a pacifier in his mouth and a rattle in his hand and waiting on his next body, you'd say there's something seriously wrong with that 15 year old over there. Well, what about a child of God who's been saved for 15, 20 years and still have never uh, come to understand what Paul is talking about here in this passage? That they're still living off the milk of the word when God says, I don't want you just to stay close to where you got in. I want you to grow and mature so that you can know the difference when the lies of Satan come to try to deceive you. He desires us to grow. Then there, there, there's a powerful fourth stone and it's called the, the provision for salvation. This is about as basic as it gets. This is just elementary stuff, Christianity 101. But uh, Paul is saying to Timothy here in in verse five, he says, now, Timothy, if your ministry is gonna grow, if your life is gonna make a difference, you really gotta know what the message is. And the message is this, there is one mediator, in verse five, between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. A couple of words I want to pull out of here. One is the word mediator. 
that, that is the person who stands in the gap between two opposing people who are at odds with one another and they exercise arbitration and mediation until they bring those two opposing people together again. There's one mediator. And then he goes on and he says, the man, Christ Jesus, is the mediator. Now, notice what he didn't say. He he didn't say there's one mediator between God and man and it is... uh, it, 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 it is Father O'Connell. Now to my Catholic friends, to my Protestant clergy friends, he didn't say that it is the priest. He didn't say it's the pastor. He said, Christ Jesus. Now let me help you, let me help you. The day that you get saved, the day that you turn away from sin, place your faith in Jesus, you became a believer. And every believer is a priest. Every believer has the ability to go before God. Every believer can communicate with the Lord. He said, One mediator, the man, Christ Jesus, who broke down the barriers and the dividing walls of hostility and provided a way for man to know God and for God and man to be brought together. And the Bible says that he did that as a ransom. What's a ransom? who gave himself a ransom in verse six. What's a ransom? It's a price. It's a price. Who gave himself as the price. That's what Jesus did. Now the Bible says this, though for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is Death. There is a set fee for sin. It's death. There, there are some things that have a set fee. Now, when you leave today and you get back out here on Indian Trail for every road, um, temptation is going to hit because you're going to see if I go around this line of traffic, uh, I can go across that solid white line right there. And I can get up there into those two turning left lanes up there. And I don't have to sit here until I, that line curves back around. Where I just cross over the line. And I want you to understand that's $275 and four points. <laughs> now, I know that because some of you have done that. Some of you have done it. There are some things that the price has already set. The wages of sin, the price has been set. And it is death. Jesus died on a cross and paid our sin debt in full. He paid every man's fine. He became a ransom. He became the price. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I was a little bit of a history buff in school. Enjoyed it until I got into world history and then church history. I didn't like either of those too much. I I really liked uh, American history. It, it's, it's, a, it's just really good for me. I, I don't know how many of you, there are lots of little tidbits, lots of stories that came out of the American Revolution that 
is really mind blowing. I, I read one, in, read one very interesting just recently, and, and go dig it up. You'll you'll you find it really very interesting story about a guy by the name of Peter Miller. Uh, Peter Miller lived in uh, Ephrata, Pennsylvania, and he was a he, he was a revolutionary pastor. Uh, he pastored a little church up there in Ephrata, and he was sold out, born again, spirit filled man of God, and, and he really was on a mission. I, I'm, I'm going to make a difference in my life for Christ, and and, and he, his reputation of integrity. It was just spread everywhere and he made some great friends. But there was one man in the town by the name of Michael Widman, W-I-D-M-A-N, who made it his mission to destroy the influence of Peter Miller. And he publicly accused him falsely of fraud and immorality and all kinds of other major injustices, none of which ever did sink and stick. But he made Peter Miller's life miserable to the point that if they just met walking on the sidewalk, uh, Michael Widman would spit on him every time. If he possibly could, he would trip him. He, he tried to hurt him physically. And that went on for years. One day, Peter Miller heard that Michael Widman had been arrested, charged, tried and found guilty of treason and sentenced to hang. Now, Peter Miller was very poor. He didn't even have a horse. And so he left his house one very cold winter morning in the middle of the winter, snow everywhere, at great risk to his own life, frostbit, hungry, walked 72 miles from Ephrata, Pennsylvania to Valley Forge where he went in to see his friend that he had made down through the years in George Washington. And he said, General Washington, I have come to request the stay of execution for Michael Widman. George Washington said, well, Peter, um, it's very admirable that you would come on behalf of your friend to ask for his stay of execution, but uh, it will be carried out as instructed. Peter Miller said, friend, friend, he's not my friend. He is the worst adversary that I've ever had in my life. George Washington was overcome by the compassion and forgiveness that Peter Miller had demonstrated. And he said, so since you have come on behalf of your enemy instead of your friend, that changes the game entirely. And he granted a stay of execution for Michael Widman. Peter Miller carried that authorization down to the prison where Michael Widman was held, went into the jail, to the cell, took Michael Widman by the arm and escorted him out of the prison, out of the yard, and walked the 72 miles with him back to Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Two weeks later, Michael Widman knelt and received the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. My Jesus ransomed me while I was still his enemy. He came and he took me by the arm and he said, your debt has been Paid. I have come to walk you home. You could die 
in the next 10 minutes. Do you have the assurance that you'd go to heaven? Can you go back to a place where you realize that Jesus paid your sin debt and your ransom and you received him that day and he's been walking home with you ever since? I'm going to ask you right where you're seated. If that has never happened to you, it can happen. And it can happen right here. And it can happen right now. And I want to pray with you as you invite Jesus into the cathedral of your heart. Would you pray with me? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Father, I pray for this congregation. I pray for every man, woman, and young person in this uh, auditorium that has never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus that today they may say yes. If that's your desire, pray something like this with me. Really mean it with all of your heart. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus on the cross paid my sin debt. Right now, I'd like to ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart and into my life. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life.